Aren't you glad all is well? Yeah. All is well because of the Lord. Yeah. You know, we think of all the, all the stuff in the world. I tell you, we get so frustrated and, and been out of sorts and been out of shape. And, but man, all is well. Can you imagine? Uh, man, just imagine living uh, without the Lord. Just for a moment. Remember what that was like to live life apart from Jesus Christ. I want you to take your Bible and open with me this morning to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 9. In Isaiah chapter 9, we come to a very prophetic passage of Scripture. Uh, the implications of which uh, are truly phenomenal. Uh, that Jesus Christ did come. We, we find in recorded history the birth of Jesus Christ. But we're thankful that he's coming back. And uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time this morning looking at all the prophetic aspects of this, understanding this, that in, in Isaiah chapter number 9, God speaks to his people, the children of Israel, and he makes them a promise. And understand this, that the children of Israel, they were not good. They were bad. They were terrible. They were wicked. They were idolatrous people. And yet, the good, you know what the goodness of God depends upon? It does not depend on me. The goodness of God does not depend on you. The goodness of God depends on God himself. And, and, and generations before, we can trace this all the way back to the book of Genesis. When God spoke uh, to Abraham when God called Abram out of the Ur of the Chaldees and, and made a promise to Abraham that in him all nations would be blessed and that God would take this one man who was nothing at all, was least of all the people of the earth, and from him make this great nation, the nation of Israel. That promise was an unconditional promise. It wasn't based upon Abraham. Abraham failed, didn't he? Multiple times Abraham failed. Multiple times Abraham failed to live by faith in God, took matters in his own hands, and sought to, to play God, to fulfill God's promise himself. We, and we see a lot of problems in the world today because of that. We fast forward the, the clock of history to the time of David. And God makes a promise to David that his kingdom would be established forever. And this, this promise was not conditional, uh, it was not conditioned to David's goodness. David, though a man after God's own heart, was still a miserable failure, failure just like us. Still just a bunch of, just a sinful man. Failed with Bathsheba, failed in, in counting the, the uh, you know, taking that census of the people. He failed. But God made the promise, and God would bring it to pass. And as we come here to Isaiah chapter number 9, we find, you know, consider, concerning the nation of Israel, that God had given many promises. God made promises to bless them. God made promises to curse them. And may I tell you, if the curse is real, which it is, they were depart, deported for 70 years, the, the curse is real. They transgressed the law of God. They paid for it. The curses were real. Well, so too are the promises. And, and, and God promises here to the children of Israel that he is going to establish a kingdom. And that Jesus is coming back. And he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. The apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, declares that he, speaking of Jesus, must reign. And he will reign. And as we come to this passage this morning, again, it's, it's highly prophetic. But may I tell you, it's also very practical. If you're able, I invite you to stand with me this morning. We're going to read together here uh, two, chap uh, two verses, uh, two chapters, yeah, hold on. Uh, two verses from the Word of God this morning. Isaiah chapter number 9, we'll begin reading in verse number 6. We'll read through verse number 7. Already this passage has been read this morning by our children. The Bible says this, For unto us a son, or I'm sorry, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, 
And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and and peace there shall be no end. Upon the, the throne of David and upon his kingdom and to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forevermore. The Bible says the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Father, we thank you for the word of God this morning. And Lord, I, I, I'm thankful for Christ uh, that is spoken of here in these two verses of Scripture. Lord, we think so much of, of holiday festivities that we miss you. And you are the unspeakable gift. So God, this morning as we come to the Word of God, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. Father, that you would help us. Help us know you better today that you would help us grow in our knowledge and our understanding, but Lord, in our application of your word in our lives. Lord, this passage of Scripture gives us great hope. Gives us hope not just for today only, but for eternity. Lord, our hope is rooted in the person of Jesus Christ. We're thankful that you came to this earth died upon the cross, rose in victory from the dead. We're thankful for the salvation you give us and we come to you by faith. Lord, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to your mercy, we're saved. And so God, today we pray that you would make your word very real to us. Lord, the next week is going to be very busy for all of us. Many of us have still many things to prepare, places to go, people to see. But Father, amidst the busyness, our hectic schedules, our hectic lives, the chaos in which we live, Lord, give us silence here in these moments. And Father, may you speak to our hearts and show us who you are and what you provide us. And so, Lord, we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. From the habit of marking things in your Bibles, I'd like to draw your attention. Well, there are many things we could highlight from this passage of Scripture. You know, we we see the promises of verse number 7, the uh, the increase of government, the peace, you know, the, the kingdom of David, the throne of David. We could, we could look, and we, and we thank the Lord that a, that a child was born. And even God told Mary, through Gabriel the angel, that, that she was to name him Emmanuel, which is God with us. We can, we can look at all of these things, but I want, you to, I want to draw your attention this morning to the statement found in verse number 6. The Bible says, His name shall be called. His name shall be called. What does all of this mean? You know, we look here, we find in the first part of 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 verse 6 that this is a gift. He says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Over the next week to week and a half, presents will be unwrapped. Gift wrapping that you have so delicately placed around each box will be completely shredded as if no one cares. We think of all the gifts that will be received, there's no gift greater than the person of Jesus Christ. Consider these verses from the Word of God this morning, specifically the New Testament. In James chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, the Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. You know, we, in our imaginations, how many of you husbands, you've, you've thought about that perfect gift? What is the perfect gift I can give to my wife? Wives, maybe you do the same thing. You think about all the, what, what will they love? What will they appreciate? What will they not use more than once and cast aside and sell for pennies at a garage sale a month from now? 
what, what, am I, what is this? What is this perfect gift? If you're looking for a perfect gift this year, you just have to look to Jesus Christ. The Bible says this, And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And the Bible says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The gift of salvation, what a perfect gift. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, familiar passage tells us, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15 says, Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. However, perhaps there's one greater expression, no greater expression of God's gift to man than is found in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What an amazing, wonderful God we have. And too often we forget that God has, has given us Himself. For unto us a child is born, Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. We find that he will rule and reign. We're look, people are looking for a utopia, aren't they? They're looking for answers and solutions in government which cannot be found in this government or any other government taking place in the world today. The only answer will come from Jesus Christ, who will rule and reign for a thousand years. But the Bible makes a statement in verse number 6, again, concerning His name. His name shall be called. Have you ever considered how wonderful the Lord's name is? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. His name shall be called Emmanuel. God with us shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, the Greek equivalent, the Jewish name, Hebrew name, Yeshua, Jehovah, is salvation. You know what's incredible? Concerning Christ this morning, this great gift that God has given you and me, is that He's in you. I want you to look with me in the New Testament book of Colossians, holding your place here in, in Isaiah chapter number 9. Why don't you turn with me quickly to Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1, one of my favorite verses in the Word of God. In this verse, we find a great deal of hope. In this verse, we find a great deal of comfort. We find a great deal of help. We find assurance. The Bible says in verse number 27, 
It says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus lives in you. He lives in you in the person of the Holy Spirit of God. And what we know of Jesus in His name is produced in your life. The Bible says that His name shall be called, look back there in, in, in Isaiah chapter number 9 and verse 6, His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You know what the world needs today? The world needs all of that. Do you know what you need? You need all of that. I need to learn to live according to the promises of Christ in His person. Again, this chapter, or this passage is very prophetic. But it's real. It's personal. He didn't just come to earth to, to live on earth and to die on the cross and to rise again. He came looking for a people. Remember what Jesus said in, in John chapter number 4 to the woman at the well. He, he said that the Father seeketh such to worship Him. He's looking for a people. He's looking for you. In chapters 14, 15, and 16 of John, we find the promises of the Holy Spirit of God that Jesus promised to, that Jesus promises to give uh, as He returns back to heaven. He promises to, uh, to send another comforter who will not... Jesus was with them, but the Holy Spirit would be in them. Just weeks ago, I stood in the upper room where the early church was gathered. In obedience to the Lord, they were there praying, and on that day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit of God came, filled each of them. At the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes to live within our hearts. He has all of us. There's never a question you and I were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, according to Ephesians chapter number 1. But as I grow in my walk with the Lord, I, I desire for Him to gain more of me each day. I'll have, I'll have all of Him I'll ever have. But I must learn to walk in the Spirit. Be led of God. But consider the, mystery of, the, ministry, the ministry of Christ in your life at this moment. We see a wonderful working of God in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6. And I pray that in each of our lives we know each of these names firsthand for what God has done in our hearts and our lives over the course of time. I want you to know what each of these means practically today. The first name, his name shall be called Wonderful. Mark that word, Wonderful. In your, in your Bible this morning. Isn't the Lord wonderful? He is wonderful. The Bible uses many adjectives to describe the Lord, but He is wonderful. So oftentimes we think of the word wonderful as something in which we can take pleasure, like, oh, that's wonderful. You hear good news, oh, that's, that's wonderful. But the word wonderful is used in a different sense. Here in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. The word wonderful here, it speaks of that which is miraculous. It's a marvelous thing. This is the Lord's doing, the Bible says in Psalm 118. It is marvelous in our eyes. Why don't you turn there quickly. Isaiah, I'm sorry, Psalm chapter number 118. Now, this is the work of God in, in salvation. What a wonderful work God has accomplished. You realize that salvation is a miracle? We've been studying in our Sunday school hour, 1 John. Just a few weeks ago, we looked at the truth of, being, of having passed from death 
unto life. How miraculous is that? We were dead in our trespasses and sins. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead, but we've been made alive. You, if, you've, if you're here this morning and you know Christ as your Savior, that's miraculous. That's not anything you've done. You realize that there's nothing in your life that you have done. We can try to take credit for things, but all glory and honor simply belongs to the Lord. His name shall be called Wonderful. The Bible says in Psalm 118, in verse 22, says the stone which the builders refuse has become the head stone of the corner. We read about that in, in 1 Peter, and how the Lord, he's the, he's the living stone. But you know what you and I are? We're a bunch of lively stones. Huh. And, he's, and he's brought us together to build this great habitation. What a miraculous work of God. It's wonderful to be part of it. It says, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The significance of this passage is its marvelous. It's wonderful. As Jesus met with his disciples there and observed the Passover meal. He broke bread. He gave them the cup. He humbled himself and washed their feet. And as they exited that room and walked down the slopes of Mount Zion and crossed the Kidron Valley on their way to Gethsemane that night of his betrayal, they sang this song. This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord's wonderful. Oh, taste and see, the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. This is where the Christian life begins. None of us are born Christians, we're all born sinners in need of a Savior. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. How He offers salvation to all of us who will simply come to Him by faith. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy that He saves us. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. For neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The Lord's wonderful. But you know what else He is? He's our counselor. Look back there in Isaiah chapter nine and verse six, and note here that He is our He's our counselor. The counselor is one who advises or gives guidance. You know what I'm thankful for? I'm thankful that the Lord will guide me along life's journey. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Have you ever made a decision without consulting God? Probably every one of us have and live to regret it. But you know what God wants to be? You know who Christ is? Remember, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's wonderful, but He's also your counselor. He will guide you. He will direct your steps. Uh, we're, we're thankful for the, for the work of God. Consider some of the promises we read here in the book of Psalms. For instance, in Psalm 73 and verse 23, the Bible says, Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. God will guide you with His counsel. In Psalm 37, 
verses 3, 4, and 5, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. God is your guide. Are you allowing him to guide you through life? How do, how do we receive instruction from the Lord? How do we receive this guidance? Whenever I'm forced to make a, a decision, a big decision or any decision, every day is filled with decisions, isn't it? I, I don't know how many decisions I've made this morning, but it began when I decided to open my eyes. You know, you lay there and think, I really don't want to get up this morning. All right. And you open your eyes. I would rather just stay here in bed where it's nice and warm and not snowing. <laughs> and then I decided to get out of bed. I decided to walk down the hallway. I decided to eat breakfast. I decided to get dressed and come to church. I decided to be here today. I decided. We make decisions. Why do you decide to do what you do? Do you desire to please God? Or are you just, ah, I think it's just a decent thing to do. Well, God has a perfect plan for your life, whether we realize it or not. And instead of our lives being lined with times we've told God no, or when with times we've questioned God, or, or make a decision outside the will of God, May the Lord help us consult Him. He's our counselor. He will guide you by His Word. You know what? God will never lead you to do anything contrary to this book. The Bible says, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Church, this morning, it's Christ in you. He's your counselor. Do you have big decisions pending in your life? You should consult Him. Ask God for counsel. Ask Him what His Word says, and then read His Word. Don't, sar don't starve yourself from God's Word. Read the Word of God. Walk in truth. He's your counselor. But notice what else he is back in Isaiah chapter number 9, in verse number 6. He's the mighty God. And may I tell you, this is where it, became, where it gets real. You know, he's, he saves us. We're thankful for that. He, he provides us the counsel we need. But may I tell you, he's the mighty God. Has God ever led you to do something that's bigger than you? All the time. But he's mighty God. He's, he's not subject to you. God is not subject to the circumstances of your life either. He's mighty God. There's, there's no limit to God's power. There's no limit to God's ability He's mighty, he's powerful, he's valiant, and, and there's nothing he cannot do. I, we sing the song with our kids, our, my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the valleys are his, the stars are his handiwork too. How big is your God? My God is immense. My God is infinite. He dwells in eternity because, because time cannot contain Him. My God is omnipotent. Consider the testimony of God. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 6 that there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. In Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 17, the Bible says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. There's nothing too hard for your God. 
Realize that salvation, he, He's wonderful, it's miraculous, He saved you by His grace, you've been begotten again. <laughs> Born again of God's Spirit. He lives within you in the person of Christ. He is now your counselor, but sometimes life is hard, isn't it? Sometimes following God is difficult. Most of the time it's easier to not follow the Lord than to follow God. But may I tell you, the consequences of not following the Lord are much harsher than those of following Christ. And we serve a big God. Sometimes following the Lord brings unforeseen circumstances into, the, into our lives, doesn't it? The things fall across our way that we don't anticipate. Things that there's no way around and there's no, you can't scale them. You can't circumvent them. But you have a mighty God. And there's nothing too hard for Him. And as we walk in the walk with the Lord, we, we come to know Him better each day. And Romans chapter 5 speaks of the experience we gain walking with God which provides us with hope and assurance that our God is able. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, but my God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. He's a mighty God. And we can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth us. But look back in Isaiah chapter number 9. In verse number 6, we see something else about our Lord. Yes, He's wonderful. Yes, He's counselor. Yes, He's mighty God. But He's also the everlasting Father. He's your Father. We think of orphans, and I was reading a letter this week that I got from a dear friend, Dr. Clayton, Larry Clayton. I love that man. We need to get him back, don't we? Have him come preach for us. But man, he's, he's got these orphanages in Pakistan where he takes these, they find these children that, are, that work in the brick kilns and they give them a place to live because they have no parents. They have no one to take care of them. It's incredible. But you know what? We have a Father that will never abandon us. We have a God who will never for, for, fail us, who will never forsake us. He's an everlasting Father. You know, we have, we all, everybody in here, if you're born, you have a Father. It's just the laws of nature. It's how God created it. As earthly fathers, our sons, our daughters will always be our physical offspring. There's nothing we can do to change that. There's nothing we can do to alter that. But you and I, we've been begotten again of the Lord. We've been adopted by God Himself. We're, no, we're not spiritual orphans anymore. Amen. The Lord. We have a Father who, who is everlasting. Consider the promises of God this morning. Look with me, if you would, in Psalm 68. Psalm 68 in verse number 5, speaking of God's ministry to those hurting. It. He says that He's a father to the fatherless. A judge of the widows is God in His holy habitation. But he's a father to the fatherless. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 this morning concerning the mighty work of God in our lives. In Ephesians chapter 2, we find uh, statements in you at the quick in verse 1 who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience 
among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And notice, we were by nature what? The children of wrath, even as others. But not anymore. We have a new father. Look back, look in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter number 8, as you turn there, listen to what the Bible says in Galatians chapter number 4, in verses 4 through 7. It says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more servants, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through through Christ. In Romans chapter 8, the Bible says this, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You have a father. Your earthly father may fail you. You may be forsaken. You may be forgotten. You may be abandoned. But you have a heavenly father. And it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And you know what Jesus says? The Bible refers to him as an everlasting father, but Jesus says, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. He's an everlasting father. But notice lastly this morning, back in Isaiah chapter number 9, in verse number 6, we learn that he's the prince of peace. He is the prince of peace. In a world that's filled with chaos, you can have peace today. Because peace, true peace, comes only through Christ. Peace is not the absence of trouble. Man is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. We've got a house full of trouble. Because I live in it. True peace comes from God. God alone. Years ago, I was given a book. It was entitled, Struggle to Peace. One of my college professors, (laughs) man, godly man, one day decided that he was going to move to Salt Lake City, Utah and plant a Baptist church. And he got this truckload of books called A Struggle to Peace. It was, it was the testimony of a converted Mormon girl who for years and years and years struggled to find peace was baptized for the dead hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Well, they got these books, and they mailed them to every home in Salt Lake City, Utah. It made such a splash in the community that on the evening news, there was an announcement made to not read the book Because the Mormon church runs Salt Lake City, Utah. May I tell you, there's a world filled with people who are struggling to find peace. We look for peace in in relationships. And you know what? You and I, we are created for relationship. Consider what God said about Adam. It's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a help meet for him. We need relationship, but honestly, no human relationship will ever suffice. You, if you are looking to find something where there is no struggle, good luck. When you find it, send me a, co- a postcard and I'll come and ruin it for you. 
we'll never find peace. Because true peace only comes from Christ. If you want peace, you just have to know the Lord. He's the God of all peace. And our, our Savior, He is the Prince of Peace. He came into a world filled with chaos, filled with hurt. And may I tell you, nothing has changed some 2,000 years later. The world is the same because man is still the same. There's nothing new under the sun. People are still exploring, looking for ways and means to obtain peace, to find some type of rest, but they're never going to find it apart from Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. Do you want the peace of God this morning? I want you to look with me, if you would, please, to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter number 4. You and I can have peace today because Christ has made peace. As you turn there, listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 14. Speaking of Christ, the Word of God says, For He is our peace, who hath made both one, hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. At the moment of salvation, we find ourselves at peace with God. And this comes through our relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Philippians chapter number 4, in verse number 7, and if you've never marked this expression in your Bible, I encourage you to do so today. The Bible says, and the peace of God. Are you looking for that today? The peace of God. Do you know in a world filled with chaos and confusion, heartache and pain and suffering, you can have peace. In the midst of the storm, you can have peace. He is our peace. There is no peace without Christ. He's the Prince of Peace. The peace of God. Which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The Bible says, notice this, in verse 8, he says, Finally, brethren, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You know who that's speaking of? Speaking of Christ. Speaking of Jesus Christ himself. He says, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and notice, and the God of peace shall be with you. There's one source of peace, and that's God. You can have peace with the God of peace through Jesus Christ. As we look back in Isaiah chapter 9 this morning, we can have and enjoy all of this. This is intended for you too. We don't have to wait for the millennium to enjoy it. You can have it now. And it's only through Christ. Wonderful. Counselor. The mighty God. The everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Do you have those things today? Do you need those things today? You can find them. You can enjoy them. You don't have to wait. All you need is in Jesus. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed.